they decide there's no good way they can do this to where A, they can trust Tempest to actually pay them, and B, it kind of goes against their code. They're, they kind of agreed early on they wouldn't screw each other unless the money was really, really good, you know. So they're like, there's no way they could do this and turn them in without getting their money because they were like, well, what if we, uh, it was really cold the way they were planning this right in front of them. But they're like, what if we had a guy we could trust, like turn him in and then we'd split the money. And like, no, we, we couldn't trust anybody with that much money. So they're like, they're like, fuck it, damn, we can't do this. And Brandon's like, okay, dicks. <laughs> and so like, hey, look, 10,000. 10,000! And he's like, yeah, I know, I know, but... Dude! You know. So, it was a really great moment where they were, like, planning this guy's kidnapping, like, right in front of him. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that was a great moment, nonetheless, where they're like, okay, okay. <laughs> Besides that, he's probably, you know, and, and Brendan is actually doing a really good job trying to talk them out of it, because he's like, look, look, he's just trying to the only reason he's offering this much money is to do wh exactly what's happening. Like, he's trying to turn you against me just to lure you guys out of hiding. Right? And they're like, yeah. You know what? You're right. Still, 10000 Fuck. But you're right. So, like, they go, you know what? We need to... Hmm, damn, we want that 10000 That means he has 10000 doesn't it? And like, and Brandon's like, well, not necessarily, but yeah, he probably does. Would he really go that far to get just me? And they all kind of like think, and they go, yeah, probably. But you know what? He's probably he probably wouldn't pay us, and even if he paid us, we wouldn't make it. We wouldn't make it out of the palace alive. You know what I mean? Like, he's this he's that kind of guy where they know enough about him to know they couldn't trust him as far as kick him. You know, I keep using that metaphor, but you know, they couldn't. They can't trust this guy. Eventually, they finally are like, there's no way we can trust this guy, but. There's money to be made here. So, like, uh, eventually what they start doing is they start kind of thinking about this. They were like, uh, they're like, well, look, shit. We know we can't trust this guy, but the other people in the city don't necessarily know that, or they're not as smart as we are. So, they're going to be, like, giving tips to where this guy is. And because it's a really good picture, they're going to start to, you know, it's going to be hard to maintain a cover like this. So, they start to think about. I put him in a really bad situation because Brendan's character is essentially unplayable at this point because you know he's not really well known around the city, but he can't show his face. He can't go outside anymore because fucking everybody who even sees a guy who looks like him is going to get turned in for a hundred gold pieces, right? So they're in this really bad situation where like he can't go outside, and even his own party is still kind of thinking about turning him in. But they know they can't do it because they're just going to die, right? Because they were kind of with them at the time. Um, so there's a, th this was a really great situation because there was so much they didn't know. And bottom line, what I knew is they couldn't trust him. Like, had they, had they marched him right in the door, he'd have just killed him. He'd be like, oh, my God, I can't believe you're that stupid. You know, he just walked in the door. <laughs> Shit, that was easy, you know. Um, he was really just hoping that, you know, the city would be so lured by the promise of that much money that, you know, they would eventually, like, mob mentality would kick in and turn him in. And pretty much it worked that way. But what they would do is they started thinking, like, well, in a way, we could still make money off of this. So they start scheming. And these guys were such good schemers, even I was impressed with their underhanded thinking. So they started thinking, like, okay, look. We can't make the five or ten thousand gold pieces. There's no way we can get that because even if he has it in like a box, which he probably doesn't, but let's say like best case scenario he has it in a box, we can't just go steal it. Because it's in the palace, he's gonna have people watching it, and kind of he might be expecting us to go right after the money. If he's not expecting us to just walk right in with the guy. So So they're like, yeah, and So they're like, well, but we do know where there is money being handed out. And that's the clerks who are paying for tips. Because if there's one thing we can count on in this city, it's greedy fucking bastards giving tips as to where we are. So they're like, okay, Brandon, look. You hide. You know, we're in a place nobody's going to find you. You hide. And you got to trust us now. <laughs> we're going to go. We got an idea. And Brandon's like, I don't have much of a choice, do I? And they're like, no, you don't. So they're like, so they leave. 
and they're like, look, we're not going to turn Brendan in. There's no point because we're not going to get paid. And even if we do, it's kind of a dick thing to do. We had I had a really good set of players to where like they were talking about it, but these were guys who were not going to they were not going to screw over another party member. They were they were trying to play it to where like, look. We're going to play it to the point where we're kind of loyal to each other. We're, we're bros, you know. Like, we're going to do this thing where we're thieves, we're killers, but you know what? We're bros. We're not going to turn against each other. And it was kind of a metagame thing where they're like, we're just going to work together. We're not going to do this thing where we're going to eat each other. And I was kind of hoping they would, but um, just to see what would happen. But uh, I was stirring the shit, and so they knew it. But um, so they, but they knew where the money, where some money was, and it was with the clerks thing is though so they, they start to do this thing where they scout out where the clerks were and so the clerks are of course surrounded by guardsmen like crazy they can't just they, they can't just attack the clerk because they because they'd have to kill 20 guards to get to it and they were actually thinking about it they're like you know we could do this but there's no way we can do it fast enough to not draw attention for one and probably we wouldn't get away with it clean definitely we wouldn't get away with it clean but you know who's not guarded are the guys who are giving away tips and walking away with 100 gold pieces and so they were just giving away a hundred gold pieces to anybody, um, you know, but it was, it was kind of like any reliable tips that kind of panned out. So anything that sounded good. And so basically what was going on was, um, the clerk would have this magic device. He was accompanied by a court mage who had a, t uh, who had a spell that could detect falsehood. So it would glow if the, if the guy was telling a lie. And so if the guy was lying, they wouldn't pay him. They just beat the shit. The guards would beat the shit and send him packing. But there was some guys who were telling the truth. Like, yeah, I saw this guy. He's at the Vulgar Unicorn all the time. His name's so-and-so. And I think he hangs out here. And so if the guy was telling the truth, the clerk would be like, he'd write it down. And he'd be like, thank you very much. And he'd hand him a hundred, he'd hand him a hundred gold pieces. They were scouting this out. They were in disguise. They were doing this thing. We're like, And he also hangs out with these guys. And I know where these guys hang out. So, like, there was, like, one guy out of 20, you know, who would be in line you know, giving tips and, and getting money. And so, th so they finally realized that like, uh, the clerk's guarded, but these dickweeds aren't. So they start mugging the guys who have a hundred gold pieces in the alley and taking their money. And I'm like, that's pretty good. Um, th that's, that's actually very brilliant because, uh, you also got to figure that, that the other thieves in the city are kind of thinking along the same lines. They The, the player characters just kind of got to it first. So, like, uh, so they, they kind of started this thing where, like, uh, the, anyone, who, anyone who was giving away tips was getting just violently mugged. So the party en eventually ended up making, like, 1,000, 1,500 gold pieces by mugging the informants. And eventually, all the other thieves in Sanctuary figured this out, too. So all of a sudden you had these guys either making it a big production out of either, you know, being stool pigeons, which actually in Sanctuary is kind of a death sentence already, being a guy who narks on other people, but this was a lot of money, so it was kind of understandable. So either these guys would be walking to the desk with all sorts of bodyguards, or you had these, or you had the kind of guys who hung out at the Vulgar Unicorn who couldn't afford all these bodyguards. And so you kind of had this really weird situation where even people who knew stuff who wanted to tell couldn't go tell because they were going to get mugged on the way back home for their money. So all of a sudden they didn't know it was the player characters mugging them because they were wearing masks and shit like that. And so like, but, uh, but all of a sudden you had, you had the idiots essentially giving away tips and getting mugged. So nobody was giving tips anymore because anyone who got paid, you know, anyone who didn't actually have information was getting beat up. And anyone who did have information was getting beat up and mugged. So eventually the tips just dried up. And it didn't take long. It took like a day, you know, for the tips to completely dry up. And I'm like, you know what? That's kind of brilliant to where they not only managed to make some money, but they also, again, managed to kind of embarrass Tempest to where like they got his money now and made him kind of look like a fool. So the, um, the, the way it worked was uh, it, Tempest was eventually kind of turning up the heat on these guys. And it was such a great situation where like, he was kind of this, he would, I don't want to say recurring villain because he was just always kind of the specter who was like just a step behind them where he would institute a plan and it would look like they're really, really fucking screwed, but they would put their heads together and think about it and find a way to make money out of it, right? So like the, um, the way this story keeps going 
is that eventually Tempest got so frustrated with them that uh, you know they he had, they had they, they they essentially got to keep the money from Tempest and they got to keep the swag from the temple. All of a sudden, these guys are rolling in fucking loot, like so much money. Now the downside was they had money that was marked with the royal seal of the rank and empire. And so if they started throwing money around, that would be a pretty obvious clue as to, you know, where these guys were. So they kind of had this, th- th- it's kind of the curse of the thief where you have all this loot, but it's so distinctive that they can't spend it. So that was the, that was the thing like uh, Tempest started doing where he would actually have marked money to where, you know, not only was it ranking money, he would actually mark the money. And so anyone spending this marked money was immediately under suspicion. So, so they kind of did this thing where they all of a sudden started like, they're like, well, what do we do? Well, um, well, one of us could, uh, could pay a blacksmith and kind of melt the coins down or like do something. So they start, they start doing stuff where they're like, they're fucking reminting coinage or they're, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're paying foreign privateers, you know, they're, they're, they're paying merchants that are leaving the city anyway for goods and services. You know, they're buying property and they're buying it under false names and shit like that. Really, really complex shit. They're all, they're all of a sudden like buying parts of the city and and kind of running their own rackets to where they're kind of becoming like real full-fledged crime lords in this city to where people are kind of legit afraid of them too kind of almost more afraid of them than they are of tempest and so tempest starts to realize shit nobody's afraid of me and so like he starts to call in the stepsons and i have to explain what the stepsons are the stepsons um if you think in historical context um are very much a greek um, kind of a are very much a Greek uh, fighting force, um, and 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 it's kind of a historical fact that uh, back in back in ancient Greece they would have these very specialized elite soldiers called hoplites that were that that emphasized teamwork and a special fighting style. These guys were very brutal, very elite, and um, one of the one of the aspects about some of these guys is that homosexuality among these guys was just a thing that happened you know it was not something that was necessarily frowned upon it was just a thing you know it just just happened and so that was kind of the things about the stepsons in thieves world was um these guys were kind of known for for uh they had a special fighting tactic where they would pair off they had kind of a special pair bond called this they they were called the sacred banders or the stepsons and these guys were a cavalry unit not hoplites but they would specialize in fighting in pairs and oftentimes these pairs were sometimes what not always homosexual couples and that might sound silly you might get a chuckle out of it like what these fuck what the fuck but like and and so honestly you got over that real quick because you might have laughed that these guys were like a fighting force of gay dudes not all of them but like these this is a fighting force of gay dudes but these gay dudes would fucking kick your ass like really fast these guys were good and these guys were like they they would have all sorts of specialized feats that you know these dudes would flank you and fucking kill you they they'd fuck you both ways like a pair of finger cuffs and it's funny until it happens to you so like don't laugh at these guys because they're tough so you know when you're reading the book that might be your initial reaction if you're stupid like ah oh, gay people no they're badass all right so like so, you know, these guys are really high-level fighters. They are not to be fucked with. And they're also fiercely loyal to Tempest Thales. So I'm like, they they basically humiliated Tempest for the last time. And he's like, you know what? Fuck it. You know, he's like, I'm going to bring in I'm martial law. You know what? I'm going to go in there and I'm going to fucking clean up this city if I have to fucking kill it to do it. Because Tempest has just kind of been pushed over the line, finally. Um, there's kind of a resistance to the rank and empire in there, and the party members have essentially joined up with it because anything to piss off fucking Tempest, right? So, all of a sudden, these guys are not only actively opposing Tempest, but they're actually actively sabotaging the rank and uh, influence in the city, you know, hitting supply convoys, you know, hitting major municipal buildings, causing chaos. And so Tempest is like, I gotta crack down. There's, a, there's like a full-fledged open rebellion in my city. And the guy who threw acid in my face is behind it. So, and he's still got fucking, you know, he's still scarred up. He's he's not healing. Um, he won't die, but he's not healing. And so, uh, he brings in the stepsons. 
which you know is this elite unit of guys who are loyal to him and they're like he's like i'm gonna crack down like the city guards are not enough i need the stepsons i need the sacred band to come in here and fucking crack down so um he's like anything i gotta do i'm gonna do it to to find these guys so he brings in this foreign and all of a sudden a fucking military unit is occupying the city like it's like fucking uh frontier law all of a sudden it was already pretty pretty much frontier law in the city but like now the stepsons are not fucking around you know if they catch you you're dead so like um like I, i i'm just painting the city all of a sudden it's like you know you guys are doing pretty well for yourselves you're fucking pissing off Tempest, and I know you guys are having fun, but now all of a sudden it's pretty clear playtime's over because now they've pretty much brought in the regular army, and you know, and they're like these sacred band guys. Who are these guys? And so you'll, I'm like, you'll find out soon enough. You cross them, and they're like, and they're like, oh, gay people. And I'm like, keep laughing, keep laughing. And so like, so they 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 run into these some of these sacred bander guys, and they're good. It was a tough fight because they run into about twelve of them. And when they start pairing off, you know, it's two on one every way that you can imagine it. These It's a clusterfuck, and these guys are good. Uh, so they, they're like, shit, this is serious. Fuck. Man. Um, so the sacred band moves into town, and kind of what happens is um, Tempest does another thing where he calls another meeting. He's like, look, I'm tired of fucking around. He's like, Okay, you you know, I tried to be nice. I tried to offer you guys a reward to turn these guys in. These criminals who are, you know... But he's like, you know what? I'm not going to punish them for their crimes. As long as they're free, I'm going to punish you. So, it, it, it's almost very like Robin Hood, Sheriff of Nottingham type thing. Where, like, he's kind of turned from... from from the uh, from the carrot to the stick here. That's the metaphor I was trying to think of, where he's like, "Look, all right." He's like, "I brought in the sacred band. You cross him, you're dead. Hell, you know what? You're dead anyway." He's like, "Every day that these go that, that these guys go free, people will die." And he's like, "I'm gonna pick. There's gonna be a lottery every day. There's gonna be a lottery, and I'm gonna do this." And the prince is kind of standing there going like. You know, I, I I can't tell this guy no. Like I can order this guy around, but I when he gets his mindset, I can't do nothing. You know, like so like the prince is like got a full fledged rebellion on his hands. He's like Tempest is like I'll handle this, I'll handle it. And he's like I brought in the sacred band, and really that's that was pretty much enough to do it. But he's like you know what, people are gonna die, and he's he's like you know I know you're watching. I know you guys are in the crowd somewhere watching. So I want you to watch this and watch real fucking close. And so, like, he, uh, there's, there's kind of, the, you know, they, they've been in the city so long that they developed an extensive network of contacts. And so, kind of what he started doing was, he knows enough about the underworld, he has enough informants in the city, that he knows, he doesn't know where they are, but he knows who they talk to. So, these guys have, uh, fences, you know, fences who buy stolen goods, they have people who give them weapons, they have people or contacts to the, to the, uh, to the resistance, and they have guys who, you know, informants and, and you know, people who run, you know, bolt holes they can hide in and shit like that. Thieves guild members and things like that. Um, people they buy magic supplies from. And so, he's like, you know what? I'm sick of this. So he's like, I want you to watch this real close. So he lines up the barmaids from the Vulgar Unicorn. And so they've started going back to the Vulgar Unicorn because it's one of those places where they just the guards just don't go. And so one of the characters, I forget which one, actually had a romance going with with one of the barmaids in the vulgar unicorn and this is going to sound really dark and it is and it's very disturbing and i'm like but you know what this is actually very in character for tempest and i'm not i'm just saying this is the character of tempest thales they pushed this guy over the limit and this was one of the the sickest things i've ever done in an rpg and honestly i would never do this in an rpg except for thieves world because they kind of pushed this guy to the limit and fucking tempest is evil anyway i mean like more evil than he really is fucking evil. So he's he takes one of the barmaids from the vulgar unicorn and puts her on her knees and literally skull fucks her to death in front of in full view of the entire fucking city. Like like kills her with his dick in her eye socket. And even the PCs were looking at me like, "Are you are you seriously going there?" 
Oreo is on the bed having a dream. And I'm like, uh, they, they, they were like shocked that I would go that sick on them. And I'm like, yeah, you have no idea. <laughs> Oreo, Oreo, <whistles> hang on a second. <laughs> you were having a dream, puppy. Sorry. Um, Oreo is really confused. She just woke up like, where am I? Um, so, but yeah, the party was really disturbed by this. This is like the most disturbing thing I've ever said to them was like, you just had a guy skull fuck a live woman to death with his dick. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, that is disgusting. I'm like, yeah, isn't it? And they're like, we don't even know you. And I'm like, look, I, I, now, I, now I'm all upset. I, I feel I, I'm, I'm kind of disgusted myself. And I'm like, well, I'm not saying that I would do. I'm saying Tempest fails. And, and, and I'm like, look, he's the he's the fucking god of rape. What do you want? You know, like the, he's the avatar of the god of rape. This is what he does. And they're like, yeah, but oh, <laughs> they're like, we didn't think we he was that mad. And he's like, he's that mad. And so like, he's like. So, like, Tempest, he, like, puts his pants back, his dick's covered in blood, and they're like, and they're like did we just watch that? <laughs> and so the crowd is, like, horrified. Like, rightfully horrified. And they're like, oh, my God, Tempest, ah, oh, you bastard, ah, oh, you, what did you do? You know? And so Tempest is like, yeah, I'm doing this. Like, so Tempest is like, every day that these guys don't, that these guys are not brought to me, People are going to die, and they're going to die slow, and they're going to die horribly right in front of me. I'm going to do it right here, in front of fucking everybody. And so, like, he's got a riot on his hands. This is a fucking riot. And so, he's like, he's like, stop. Stop. I'm telling you. You better stop. And they're like, ah! So they're like, down with Rankins! And he's like... So he sends in the stepsons, and the stepsons enact basically a massacre. And so, he's like, from this point forward, the city of Sanctuary is under a police state. There's a curfew. The lawlessness will end here. Turn these, find these people, turn them in. And so, all of a sudden, the mood in this city, the mood in the campaign is just changed. Like, whoa. You know, like, all of a sudden, this is, like, shit went beyond real. You know, shit has gone, like, hardcore. Like, there's like a thousand people dead in this fucking city. Like, the streets are running red with blood. And, like, Tempest is fucking skull-fucking people on the city walls. And the prince is, like, looking down at this going, like... Huh? Ah, ah, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. So, like, these guys... Um, so, this... They, the, the city... The, 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 the city's up in an uproar. And so, like, now the city's like, we gotta... And so, like, this it really became, like, almost like the Dark Knight. Where, like, you had this demagogue. You had this, you had this fucking supervillain. This god. Who's, like, just a reign of terror on this city, you know? And it really was a struggle for the soul of Sanctuary at this point. Because you had this fucking despot who is slaughtering all these people but he's just he's unstoppable you know um you can't approach this you can't kill this guy not for lack of trying you know he's got this army you know he's this this mailed fist just hammering this city and you know they don't want any more people to die because he's not he's he's fucking killing he's making examples out of these people making horrible examples out of these people and so really it was a horrible, horrible example that he set, but I was like, you know, he made an impression on this city. He's going to be killing people every day. You'd better believe that the Resistance even is considering, like, they didn't know the full fury of this guy, and you just set it loose. So, like, even the Resistance is kind of stepping away from you guys. And they're like, oh, shit, the city is... Like the city, I'm like the city might really turn on you. Like it doesn't matter how much money you have anymore. It doesn't matter how much influence you have. Like this guy, his this guy has just gone on the wall. He's got the fucking crazy eyes. Like he's up there. He's he's just fucking out of his mind. You know, he's clearly just you've you've driven this guy to the point of madness. He can't sleep. He can't eat. Ace is like festering because the goddess is so mad at him. It's not even healing. It's getting worse. 
Like he's in so much pain. He's driven. He's been driven mad, you know. So I'm like, this guy does not sleep. All he is doing is looking for you guys. And you know what? He, he's he said he's basically been on the wall and said, I am willing to burn this city to the ground if it means killing you guys. And you know what? I think the city's starting to believe him. And so I'm like, you got to do something. You got to make it good because uh, it's not going well. So the guy's like, well, we need to, like, you know what? It's time for the rebellion. So, like, they start leading this rebellion. Like, you know what? If the rebellion's stepping away from us, we're going to we're gonna fan the flames. And so, like, they start getting, there's a, there's kind of a bard character they have. And so he starts working his oratory and, and starts to whip the rebellion. He's like, this is the time. You know, like, you don't understand. Like, this is the time to strike. He's, he's fucking pissed. He's making mistakes. We've driven this guy to the point of madness. We can strike, you know? And so they're like, I'm like, uh, well, the stepsons are in the city. I'm not quite following. Um, and he's like, because these guys, they outnumber the rebellion like 10 to 1. And they're elite troopers. You're talking like, you're talking mercenaries here. And like, the, I'm, I'm talking from the from the rebellion side. I'm like, you're talking mercenaries here. And even the guy's like, we can't take the sacred band. We've tried. These, you know, those guys are tough. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but we have the, we have the luxury of knowing the city and knowing that Tempest is monomaniacal. His, his tunnel vision, us. He's tunnel vision. And I'm like, you know, you guys have a plan. I'm like, I'm really impressed. This is some of the best planning I've ever seen. I'm like, I'm like, you know, you guys are turning everything this guy does and using it against these guys are fucking brilliant. Fucking brilliant PCs. I was so impressed with these guys because I didn't know how they were going to get out of this. I was just giving them a situation and letting them go. And so they were doing this thing where like, look, we're going to do this thing. You know what? We will handle, we will handle Tempest. And I'm like, sure you will. And they're like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We are going to, uh, we're going to start, we're going to start the fight. Okay. We are going to start it in the city and we're going to make it clear where we are. We're going to call him out. All right. And he is going to send everything he has at us. So when that happens, you're storming the palace. You're going to storm the palace, you're going to kill the prince, and you're going to kill whoever's there. And Tempest, he's ours, because he's going to come personally to do us. And he's not going to expect a counter. He's not going to expect this. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. These guys are all of a sudden leading an army. These guys are like, I think, 7th level at this point. They're pretty high level, considering. But I'm like, all of a sudden, these guys have a really good plan. So, like, they have planned out a coup in the city. And I'm like, awesome. So they, they, they map out this plan, and I'm still not getting how they're planning on, on taking Tempest Thales down. But uh, eventually, then, and even they're like talking like, okay, okay, we've got this thing where like, we are the diversion, and they're going to go, like, basically, we have to be there to draw Tempest out, but Tempest is coming, and he's going to bring about 10,000 troops with him. What do we do? And so they're like, well, hmm. We're probably gonna die, <laughs> and so and they're like, "Well, that's that's not good. That's not good at all." And so they're like, "Well, you know, maybe it's not enough that maybe we can use this against them to where like, uh, you know, we, we can call them out, but we don't necessarily have to start a stand-up fight as long as we get the troops out of the out of the royal palace, you know, and out of the out of their garrisons for just long enough, and we can occupy their tent for just long enough, play and hit and run. We can do this, and Tempest will have nowhere to go." So they're like, you know, if, if we can occupy the palace and hold the prince hostage, he's still loyal to the prince. So, like, we can, we'll be in a power of negotiation here. We can at least, we'll have something. We'll have a bargaining chip, you know. We can call him out. And so they do this thing where they actually, they, they call Tempest out. They basically, what they start doing is, they, I, I called it the Chicago way, where, like, uh, you know, these steps, these stepsons were enacting frontier justice. So like they were, they were cutting people's hands off. You know, they were, they were hanging people. So they, their point of view was like, you know, they, uh, they cut off one of their hands. We cut off one of their arms. They send one of our guys to the hospital. We send one of theirs to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. That's the sanctuary way. So what they start doing is they start using the stepsons pair, like th their tactics against them to where like they would, uh, they would lure patrols, into the city and then murder them but not only murder them 
make grisly examples of them. And that was actually very... They had upped the ante almost from the from the rape on the wall, where, like, they were a kind of... They were kind of erecting shrines, like, really grisly fucking shrines. They would murder these guys and, like, go into great detail about the, the, the attention to detail these guys would put in to the examples they were making out of the fucking stepsons. Like, they were, like, making... They, they would ambush entire squads of sacred banders really tough fights but they would do it they would do it just to like you know they would give false tips or they would they would start a they would start a fight just to draw more sacred banders into a larger ambush you know or they would walk into an ambush to set up a bigger ambush because they'd be like look we know this is a tribe so they're doing this thing where like they're 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 almost dictating to me what the adventure is and it was so great so like they were doing this thing going into like fucking grisly detail because i went into grisly detail what tempest was doing it's like you know what if it's real it's fucking real so like they're killing these dudes and like and fucking uh i haven't mentioned this guy now i'm gonna make up a new name uh uh peter so peter he i, I learned a lot of things about peter in this adventure that sounded wrong um but no what uh what he started doing was he was the one who was kind of in charge of the decorating so they would kill like eight to twelve sacred banders and he was he would make a mountain of heads like he would cut their fucking heads off and make a mountain of them and so he would do that and you know he would leave them for other guards to see and he would do this and eventually that wasn't good enough he's like you know what it's good but it lacks that personal touch and so he's like okay you know what fuck it fuck it what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna do the i'm gonna do um i'm gonna nail them to a wall I'm gonna nail it like I'm gonna I'm gonna nail them to a wall. No, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do like impaling like up. The, I'm gonna because they're because they're he's he starts kind of going into hate crime territory because it's like he's like okay I'm gonna show these gay stepsons dudes I'm gonna show them so like I'm gonna impale them up the ass with a pike and then I'm gonna shove their balls in their mouth and I'm like dude <laughs> he's like what I'm like that's like that's like homophobic and horrible <laughs> and he's like no, go the tempest has driven us to this and i'm like like i'm like maybe we should stop <laughs> i'm like this game has kind of gone over the edge because seriously they, they started enacting like guerrilla warfare tactics and like there's like mass murder going on and people are getting balls shoved in their mouths and like impaled up the ass with a pike it's like cannibal holocaust and shit and i'm like like, I, like even I am like, what have I done? What have these people become? What have I forced them to become? Like, the, I've made these guys into like fucking horrible. Like, I, I, they, cr I crossed the line, and when I crossed that line, all bets were off. Like, all of a sudden, there's pikes shoved up asses. There's piles of heads. There's balls shoved in eye sockets, and I'm like oh god you know just the most horrible fucking brutal massacres you can think of that are being happened to send messages you know like we're gonna show tempest we're gonna show we are not to be fucked with so like every there was like this escalation going on where like like oh he wants to fuck people on city walls we're gonna fuck him with a pike you know like oh jesus so eventually it all comes to a head this big battle to where like uh uh, what happens is they kind of do this hit and run tactics where like they 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 basically like leave a pile of heads with a note and this note is signed by all of them saying like meet us in the i i forget where there's like there's like a town square you know like there, there's like a little town square in the in the middle of town and he leaves like a note there and he's it's like meet us there we'll end this and so tempest it, it's obviously a trap right but tempest is like i don't care like, I've got so, 10,000 fucking guys. And he's like, you know what? This is... So he brings fucking everybody. And so this is where this is where Brendan and his magic really came into play. Because he was doing this thing where he was like... He was going on rooftops. Like, he had set this elaborate ambush up where we'd ha he'd have, like, ritual circles set up on all these rooftops. And so the guys would be doing these hit-and-fade strikes against the, the stepsons... You know, by uh, by um, you know, he, they would have like a hundred of these uh, other re resistance guys kind of doing hit and fades, and they'd be throwing shit and th like setting strategic fires to funnel them into into the square where they'd turn the square into a kill zone, 
you know, and te- they, they were counting on Tempest just pounding at these traps like a hammer, not thinking straight. Um, so they caused chaos. There was smoke. There was fire. They were burning the fucking city down. This thing, like, we planned, like, two weeks. This fight took two weeks to fucking go through because it was that detailed and elaborate. And these guys were meeting outside of game time to plan the war. You know, they, they had fucking charts drawn. It was like fucking Patton going on right here. And I'm like, this is the most fun I've ever had in an RPG. Like, these guys were so involved. And so they wanted to beat this guy. They wanted to, like, not only beat him, but end him, you know? So, and meanwhile, Brendan is going from rooftop to rooftop, throwing just fiery death down on the down on the sacred banders. Because, like, you know, it's taking minutes at a time, like two, three minutes to prepare these spells. But he had all the... He had all the elements in place on these rooftops. So he's, he's like, ah, oh, and he'd go down there and jump to a next rooftop because he had these, you know, he had these escape routes planned. And so he did this for like an hour of game time, um, you know, go, just, just just hitting them. And it was really well thought out. And so sure enough, I'm rolling in the meantime for the, you know, the attack on the palace. And sure enough, they capture the prince. And so they get over there. Um, I think one of them died. I can't remember the fight. It was really tough. I think Tempest managed to catch one of them and, and killed him. But they won. They essentially won the war. And so they occupied the palace. And um, in the dungeons, uh, they, they, not only, they freed everyone from the dungeons, all these political prisoners and, and all their friends from the dungeons. And they had the prince hostage. And so Tempest is like, just fucking him. He's like, oh, fuck. You know, so... Um, so they're they're holding the prince hostage, and so they go they go all right, and so I, I eventually I kind of threw them a bone because I mentioned, and I can't remember the name of the character, but there is there is a character who's very similar to Tempest Tempest I think she's like her his daughter or sister or something like that I can't remember her name but the point is she had these um she's she's also very potent and magical and what happened was they had an adventure with her at one point that ended with Tempest capturing her and throwing her in the dungeon. And so they started thinking, like, you know, this chick's kind of on a level with Tempest. So they, they take her out of there, and she's like, she's like, so how do you want to do this? Um, I, I, I wish I could remember her name. But you, anyone who's read the books knows. And so this character's slightly different from the way she was in the books, but she's kind of on Tempest's level, so to speak. So they're like, we got the prince. What do we do with him? Because there's literally an army outside our door, and they're the only thing keeping them from kicking the door is the prince and even he even he might reach the point where he may not care so so uh they go they talk to the woman and i can't remember her name but they're like how do we kill tempest and she's like you can't and they're like that's not good enough we need to kill tempest and they're like well she's like well there is a way you can't kill him but you can um you can get rid of him for a time you can exile him from this dimension if you can destroy his corporeal form um because you can't kill him you can't like you can kill his vessel but he will return they're like okay okay how long until he returns and she's like there's no way to tell but uh it's happened before and it was a hundred years and they're like good fine good we'll be dead by then (laughs) and she's like okay um he's like but no promises but they're like okay so how do we beat him we can't and she's like you can't beat him like and they're like all of us we've got like a thousand guys in this palace he's like you you can't beat him and, and so they're like, well, so like, so like, well, no, but you don't understand. And so they're like, well, you're, you're assuming we're gonna we're gonna stand up fight. What if we were tricky here? And he's like, oh yeah, you could. You... It's like you know what? I've got these things. And so she she gets these. Uh, she has these. I'm not even kidding. Her character in the series has like these magic hair, uh, like a uh, not hair pins, but like a uh, like almost like chopsticks that like pe- that women hold their hair up. She has like these magic needles that go in her hair. She kind of has these magic needles, which she uses to basically absorb the souls of people she kills. She's kind of like an elite assassin who does this. And so she kind of gains her powers from doing that. And she's like, you could try these. Um, if you can keep them occupied long enough, I can do this. But I, I guarantee you they won't, I won't get a soul, but I, they will definitely disrupt his mortal form. And they're like, And they're like, you know what? Only chance we got. So what they do is they get on the walls... And they call Tempest, and the, the fighter of the group, the, the kind of the gladiator character, is like, he's like, okay. Um, and, and Tempest is like, you really don't think you can hold up in there forever? And they're like, we'll kill the prince. He's like, you know what? You've got an hour. Give us the prince, 
I don't even fucking care at this point. Give us the prince or we're going to come in there and fucking kill you. And he's like, I'll do one better. I'll let you in. You and me, one-on-one. And he's like, he's like, (laughs) one-on-one. He's like, you know what? All of you. It's all I wanted from the beginning. He's like, it's all I wanted. All of these people. All of these people who died. Thousands of people I've killed just to get to you. All I wanted from the beginning was you guys against me. And so, and he's like, but you were too much of cowards to, to do this. It's all I wanted. And so, and so, the, and so the guy's talking up, you know, the fighter's talking up a big game. He's like, it's, he's, he's like, yeah, but now we've got, we've got your number now. We've got, you have no idea the stuff, you know, we're capable of. He's like, oh, I, you know, so they basically like the Tempest knows there's a trap coming. Of course he knew the last one was a trap, but he, you know, he got suckered once, you know, when they took over the palace, he definitely knows something is up now, but they, they, you know, they browbeat him, they taunt him. And essentially he's like, okay, you don't have to come in. We'll come out. And so he's like, are you serious? And he's like, yeah, call your guys off. We'll call our guys off. We'll do this. You know, five on one. We'll do this. And so, uh, they finally do this thing where uh, they they fight Tempest and they keep him occupied long enough, and so they even when they're they're beaten they're beaten handily, and so he's they they're still like, even though they're beaten they're bleeding out they're still kind of taunting him. He's like it, they're kind of doing like an Arnold Schwarzenegger commando. He's like he's like you don't want to just cut my head off. You want to stick a knife in me and see what's going on when you turn it. You know? And so Tempest is like I can do it. And so like he starts he takes his knife out and he's. The the one guy who, like the one guy who he Tempest raped his girlfriend is the one guy who's like he's like start with me mother start with me, and so Tempest like takes his knife and jams it in his gut and he starts turning it and I'm like you know you're gonna die and he's like yeah fuck it I don't care and I'm like okay so he eventually he like cuts his heart out and he's he rips his heart out he's like ah, ha, 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 and he starts like eating his fucking heart and all of a sudden his his wounds are healing and he's like ah ha, ah ha, I feel so good I feel so good and so like um. And so he's he's enjoying it so much. And the other guy starts, he's like, do me next, do me next, you bitch. And so, like, he comes up to the next guy, he's like, oh! And so he's so occupied, he's in such glee that his pain is leaving, that eventually the, the woman they were talking to strikes. She plunges his plunges her fucking needles into his spine and disrupts his form, but it doesn't work. It, 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 it drops him. It, like, it knocks him out, but it takes a lot more than that to drop Tempest Fails. And so, at that point, like, everyone who is still... Like, everyone who has, like, potions quaffs what few potions they have and just, like, jumps on the guy. There's, like, four of them left, and they just, like, jump on the guy. And they're raining shots down. They're raining shots. Um, like, just... They pummel this guy into fucking jelly. Like, even the, pe- even the puddles of jelly, they're hitting. Because the puddles of jelly are moving. And so eventually they take, like, fucking kerosene and they burn that. And the ashes are moving. And so, like, they take the fucking ashes and they throw the ashes. And so they're like, we fucking killed Tempest Thales. And so I'm like, yo, okay, that's good, that's good. Uh, you know, and it was such a it was such a long campaign. Well, it must have been, like, six months this campaign lasted. And ordinarily, like, even, I think I know even hardcore fans of theater are like, you can't kill Tempest that way. You just, you can't. It wouldn't happen that way. And you know what? You're probably right. But this was such a hard-fought victory. This was such a well-planned victory, and they worked so hard for it that they knew they hadn't beaten this guy. Not definitively. Like, basically, this guy was going to come back one day, and it wasn't going to be, you know, 100 years from now. Like, he was going to come back someday, but today, they won, you know. So they that was basically where the campaign ended, was because they essentially had thrown Thieves World into fucking upheaval. You know, they'd basically taken over Sanctuary. Um... So I was, you know, things got in the way, people moved away, I got a job, um, and we essentially couldn't continue the campaign. I was going to do the thing where essentially there was another race of people called the Basib, who are from across the sea, and they would, they essentially take over, in the novels, this is not much of a spoiler, um, in the novels the Basib come, and they basically take over the city from the Rankins anyway. So I was going to do this thing where I was going to fast forward to when the base had come, and they essentially just straight up conquer Sanctuary out from under them anyway. Um, so it doesn't it didn't matter if the Rankins were in charge or they were the base that were going to come and kill them anyway. But this was such a satisfying victory for them, and it was so richly deserved 
I let them, and it came at such great cost, you know, that they deserved it. I let them have it. And you know, honestly, I didn't let them have anything. They planned it. They deserved it. They did it. You know, it was a plan that probably wasn't going to work. It cost them dearly to make it work and it worked, you know? So this was a very long, um, I'm not sure all that compelling story, but it was one of the best games I ever, I ever played. Uh, one of the best examples of player teamwork and one of the worst examples of player teamwork when they were considering turning Brendan in. But, um, I don't think he was ever in any real danger of that happening because they never trusted Tempest. But, you know, it was one of those things where, like, the money was so good, like, in character, they had to still kind of think about it, you know. Um, but it was such a great example of them taking a really bad situation and using their heads and role-playing, um, some of the best role-playing I've ever seen, to where they weren't playing noble characters, but they were playing smart characters. They were playing, they were playing self-interested characters, but also had a mind for the bigger picture, you know. So they, uh... It was some of the best teamwork I'd ever seen, where they didn't use knowledge of the of the you know they didn't use knowledge of the novels to as an unfair advantage. They used knowledge of how people act and their knowledge of the characters as I portrayed them against them. So, and they used their own weaknesses as strengths, like you know Brendan with the spellcasting, or you know the the notion that um, that you know the psychology of the city the greed of certain people and you know how predictable certain people can be when it comes to rage or greed or love that they use that knowledge to such profound effect it was a great campaign it was a disturbing campaign it ran the gamut from the the highest points to the lowest points you know there was violence revenge sports true love marriage um it was so yeah um you know, and honestly, third edition was not the best system for that game, but it was the setting was so rich, and the, it was one of those great examples of a great role playing group that uh, everyone was pretty much on top of their game. I mean, there was a few people who were kind of flaky on that one. You know, Matthew with his he's not that kind of thief character. He was the character who died in the initial wave, in the initial fight, because we could never establish what he did well, and apparently. Uh, fighting was not one of the things he did well you know fighting four and one anyway um running away from tempest was not one of the things he was not that kind of thief um you know the the priest basically dropped out after a after a after a few weeks he just didn't he didn't his character did not fit in all that well and you know things got in the way but um it was such a great campaign and such a great setting uh kind of a hard setting to get into but they they took it they owned it um it was one of those examples where the setting defined who they were and how they would act. And it was, it, it really fit in. I, you know, I, I think in a different setting there, it was, I, I think I really kind of figured out their mentality as a group of players to where, um, they weren't necessarily like, you know, this, the, the traditional lawful good hero type guys, but they were the kind of guys who, who, um, they could read a situation, you know what I mean, and, and know how to turn it to their advantage. And so they were the kind of guys who were impulsive, sure, and to a degree they would kind of rebel against being obviously uh, railroaded into a campaign hook to the point where, like, if they saw the plot railroad coming, they would jump the other way. But to a degree, they would also make it interesting when they did it. They wouldn't do it just to do it. They would do it because their characters would act a certain way and because it would be more interesting that way. Now, the ass in the face was as purely impulsive, and they definitely should not have done that. In fact, Brendan, to this day, uh, was like, I really should have fucking done that. I'm like, no, you shouldn't have. You really need to... I, I, you really should have, like, rolled initiative or something like that, but he, he, he cut me off, and he said it so quickly. I was like, you know what? Okay, you did it. Because nobody was expecting that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was, it was one of those examples where, uh, you know... Um, there was a lot of unpredictability. It was kind of, the entire campaign was predicated on unpredictability, but it was that good kind of unpredictability where um, I was no longer dictating the adventure. You know, I was just, they were coming up with ideas and I was telling them the results of those plans to where, to, it was to the point where I didn't have to come up with adventures. I didn't have to come up with um, a reason to get them involved, you know, they instigated a situation and the the involvement was just kind of i won't say logical development but you know the situation 
progressed from one step to another the way these characters would act. I didn't have to come up with a reason to involve them. You know, they things would happen and they reacted to it. And so in a way, that's kind of a great way to run a campaign. You know your campaign is cruising when you no longer have to give them a payoff. Like, you no longer have to have Tempest Thales come to them and say, like, I've got this job, 100 gold pieces each for you to go do this. Because that's the hook. You know, you, it's an obvious hook. It's, you're, you're kind of walking, you're jumping through the DM's hoops, and it's pretty obvious that if you go off the beaten path, the DM has nothing planned, you know? So, um, you can understand why players rebel against that to the point where they want to do their own thing. And this was a case where, with the setting the way it was, with the city the way it was, and characters who were not going anywhere, with a guy like Tempest and the Prince and, and the city guardsman whose behavior was well known, they had other characters there as well. But with their characters whose behavior was so well known and predictable to a, to a degree, it was just a cause and effect type of thing. Where, you know, you knew how a guy was going to react when something happened. And, you know, the party would react to certain things. I'm, I'm going on about this. But it was such a brilliant game. Um, one of the best examples of, of a game that was just so organic that it grew. It just grew naturally and flowed. You know, um, that's why I never used the published campaign settings. You know, I used the maps. I used the, I used the published campaign notes for, like, locations and, and shit like that. You know, NPC stats. And, and Tempest, you know, by and large, was so hot. The guy is the highest level ca character in the entire fucking campaign. The guy, you know, they, there was no taking this guy. And I told them from the beginning, like, look, you know, this guy is essentially Achilles. You know, this guy is, this guy is Kratos. That You will not. I was like, as far as you guys know, you can try to take this guy, but you're not going to. You know, um, he's just that well known. The guy, is a, the guy is a figure of legend. You know, the guy, they've spoken of this guy for hundreds of years. Um, so there's no beating this guy. And they're like, okay, we know that, but that's not to say we won't try. And I'm like, fair enough. Okay, fair enough. So um, that was the story of Thieves World, the very long and drawn out story of Thieves World. I have no idea how long this was. Probably around, jeez, what time is it? I'm almost willing to hazard that was about 90 minutes. Uh, we'll see. I'll probably break this up with some commercials. I don't know, but we'll figure it out. But um, there, there's about three aspects of that one. The, uh, the, the acid of the face, the skull fucking, and the Chicago way. So I might split them up, split them up into three parts. We'll see. But um, I've got a lot more to come. I just really hope you enjoyed that story. I'm gonna get a drink. But thanks for watching.